We're joined um, uh, today for this session about stimulation and fresh thinking with female entrepreneurs. Uh, it's a tonic against tired narratives, and do send your questions in. Um, it was prompted by the Female Edge and their observation of the support network that they've created to encourage and support female entrepreneurs. And here to discuss all of this and more, uh, delighted to welcome Leanne Oliver of uh, the Female Edge, who are sponsoring this session, Ellie Rowley, a regional ecosystem manager, great word, ecosystem manager of NatWest, specifically focused on entrepreneurs, Claudia May of Storm Consultancy, a B Corp digital agency which supports tech scale-ups, Alison Ettridge, founder of Cardiff based data led talent intelligence ca company Stratagems, also one of our uh, entreleaguers this time around. And also delighted to have Jane Ellis Brush, entrepreneur and academic at the University of Bath, uh, following a, a senior corporate career. Welcome to you each. Um, let's begin with uh, Leanne. Um, tell us about the Female Edge, what its role is, and uh, why you do what you do. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks so much for having us um, today. Um, the Female Edge is about bringing women, female entrepreneurs, business leaders together to create new ideas, shape businesses and grow value. We really believe that the more women we have seen running their own businesses, the greater the power and influence of women. Um, and this will change the world for the better. So absolutely delighted today and thrilled to be joined by some of these superb panel panelists um, with us. Um, I know all of us have, have had the, the opportunity to catch up with you all who've joined us. Um, we're all passionate women in business, and we really want to maximize our time on the session. So if we get straight into the details, as you've said, Greg, um, the greater diversity of entrepreneurs um, and business leaders that we have, the greater and the positive impact that we'll have on our business ecosystem in the UK. So it's clearly a good thing. Um, as you alluded to, everyone is capable of coming up with some good ideas. Um, yet we see fewer entrepreneurs, um, women entrepreneurs, and we see that there is this gap. So maybe if I just hand over to Ellie at this point, um, your CEO at NatWest, Alison Rose, she seems to be a bit of a, a change maker in this area. Um, and I'd just love to know a little bit more about her and the Rose Report as well. Yeah, absolutely. So at NatWest, it's, um, we've transformed over the last few years and it really does feel like a purpose-led business with Alison Rose as our CEO. So back in 2019, um, the Treasury commissioned her to lead an independent review of female entrepreneurship. Um, and that shed light on some of the challenges that women who are starting and growing businesses face. Um, all sorts of different things, such as access to finance and funding, which I'm sure there's plenty of people on the call that can resonate with. Access to expertise and mentors. Where are those role models? Where do we find them from? And things like business support. So. We are more generally uh, responsible for um, looking after our children or our parents. How do we facilitate um, growth when we have 68% of those responsibilities? So it was really interesting that over the last few years, we've done different publications giving updates. So um, there's plenty of people on board. We've now got 134 signatories on the Investing in Women Code, which is essentially committing to make change we can do this, we can make it so that there's a more balanced um, business world out there. And it showed that in 2019, 250 billion pounds could have been added to the UK economy if female-led businesses grew at the same rate as men. And in the last year, 140,000 new female-led businesses were founded. So we have plenty of progress that's been made, but more to do. And I'm really excited for this panel today to kind of discuss that in a little bit more depth. Brilliant. Um, that is just an absolutely outstanding figure. 140,000 newly created female-led businesses. That, that's amazing. Um, so, Jane, um, I know you've worked in the corporate world for years. Um, you've recently moved more into kind of the educational stream and very recently into um, entrepreneurship. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your experience in that um, and also how you believe more women will become successful entrepreneurs. Thanks, Leanne. Well, it's great to be here. Yeah, I'm, I've spent uh, 30 years in corporate life, most recently as a managing director at Citibank, um, and actually just last year decided to become uh, a teacher, academic at the University of Bath. But uh, at the same time as that, I established something called First Impressions, which was there to help build confidence through giving women uh, opportunities to get interview clothes and interview coaching uh, at our uh, little boutique we have just established in Bath. Um, 
And I guess starting the route as being, I've, I've had a business for quite a long time, but um, becoming a social entrepreneur uh, has been a really interesting journey for me. I've been lucky enough to be, um, I guess, uh, have a place on the School for Social Entrepreneurs, which I've just completed, um, which is a government funded scheme. Um, but I think, you know, for me, it's, it's been obvious to me, it's, uh, I guess the thing I would say is it took a lot, it's taken a lot longer than I expected to actually get things moving. Uh, I think there's an awful lot of patience required. It, it's a uh, corporate life makes you want to rush and hurry and get everything done really quickly. But when you become an entrepreneur, you find you have to do all the things that you had lots of other people to do. So you become the, the head of marketing, the head of finance, the, you know, you have to be a jack of all trades. Um, and I've had to learn some new skills and some of them I'm not great at. So that's been quite challenging. Um, and I think, you know, the thing that I've got help with is through the network. So I found a massive network here in Bath, actually, and I didn't have a network at all because I moved here from abroad. So I didn't know anybody. So the network's been amazing. Um, but I think we need more courage from what I've seen in terms of just if we think something's good, women should be going for that. Uh, and I also think that we women still undersell ourselves. So I found in corporate life, you know, women never asked for pay rises, men always did. Um, it's the same as actually running your own business. A lot of women probably don't value their time as much and therefore probably sell themselves cheaper as an entrepreneur. So I think, um, I don't know how that will help them in terms of uh, success, but I think, you know, certainly under marketing and undervaluing yourself is, is a constant thing that women do. And we need to be, um, you know, really strong and confident about what we do and what we can bring. Because, I, you know, I, having seen a lot of female entrepreneurs um, in the school I've been at, um, probably 90% of the attendees were women. women. Really good to see and really interesting. So, I, you know, I, I think we have to help each other uh, get stronger and, and um, move forward. Yeah, and I think that bit about women underselling themselves, I mean, mm -hmm. you do see this kind of like, it's a consistent message that comes yes. up. Um, and yeah, kind of unlocking what are those either funding opportunities or why do we not get the same amount of funding or are we not good at selling ourselves? Um, I'd love to just hear a little bit from Alison. Um, you've got first-hand ex experience from Stratagems with receiving funding. So how have you found that? Um, how has it gone? Have you found barriers? Um, and how have you overcome those barriers as well? Wow, that was a lot of questions. Um, uh, so I, I can relate a lot to what Jane said. So I spent 20 years in corporate life um, and came out. And, and actually, I think number one is resilience, right? So we all, we actually, most women have a very high level of resilience, but it's about using it perhaps, perhaps in a different way. Um, and that was critical for me in our funding journey. So I launched um, Stratagems or came out with the idea for Stratagems in late 2017 and went out for funding pre-product and pre-revenue, which is unheard of. Um, but I said, there's a great space in the market. I'm used to selling to large corporates. I spent 25 years doing it and there is absolutely a need for it. So I've got no wireframes, I've got nothing. Um, and I don't know how many no's I got. Um, I didn't count the no's, um, I just counted the yeses. And I think that's, that's the first message is that you have to take every no as a way of learning and not as a criticism of self. And actually, when I kind of look back in hindsight, I think it wasn't that the business was bad. It wasn't that we didn't have a good idea. It was the way that I was explaining it wasn't simple enough for people who weren't in our space to get. And so that's kind of number two is get to the point where you talk about the purpose of your organization very clearly. So Stratagems is used by the world's biggest companies to make smarter decisions about where to invest, where to grow, and the diversity of their makeup. So just really nailing what it is that, that you do. I guess the second bit that was really important, and, and I, I love this because this ties in a little bit to what Ellie was saying and, and the Rose Review, is um, one of the things that Strashens does is it takes data from what we think is the richest data set on the planet, right? So the roles, skills, and diversity of people in the workforce. Um, and we had a look at the founders and co-founders prior to um, coming on today, because we just thought actually it'd be quite cool to have a look at the data set that looks at co-founders and founders in the UK. And 35% of the current founders and co-founders in the UK are women. But the top industries for the businesses that were founded by women were design, health and fitness and retail. The top industries for businesses that were founded by men were software internet and financial services and so if we look at the funding landscape and we look particularly at 
seed funding, angel funding and venture capital funding. Actually, all of those require businesses that are going to give high levels of return to their shareholders. And so as women, if we are taking a business out to those particular funding sources and saying, I want funding, but you're doing it in a business sector that won't show the same returns as a software business. Actually, the no is probably to do with the business and the sector you're in and less about you. And I think if, if we are very definitely going to look at how we change the funding landscape for women in the UK, we have got to look at alternative sources and methods of funding for those businesses that don't tick the box. Right? I'm lucky I, I run a software business. We can build annual recurring revenue with high levels of return. Um, but I don't think that's the same for a lot of female founded businesses. Yeah, absolutely. I can build on that as well. So um, less than 5% of venture capital funding goes to female-led businesses. But mm -hmm. I do think it's interesting um, what you're saying there about sectors as well, because um, they're slightly more cutthroat, I guess, in terms of getting that money back. But there is an angel community out there, and that's what um, in the Southwest I'm particularly looking to try to build. Um, and not only that, thinking about the diversity of angels because as we all know we invest our time and energy in people that are similar to us so if we have excuse me for saying middle-aged white men who have the money to be able to give away who are they going to invest in so firstly raising awareness of the actual opportunities that could come from these female-led businesses but also how do we make sure there's more female angel investors yeah, that's, it's such an important, interesting point because, like we've said, it's not just female-led businesses, it's female-led investors as well. And typically, again, women invest in either people they know rather than take a hunch on someone they don't know, and whereas men are more likely to do that. So, yeah, it kind of raises so many interesting points. And how do we close that gap? How do we actually educate women to be confident investors as well as founders of businesses? And I think that's something really, sorry to jump in, Leanne, but I think that's something really important. And, and Jane, I know you've also come from a corporate background. Um, I didn't know about SEIS and EIS investments when I was earning shed loads of money, right? <laughs> now I'm not earning shed loads of money. I know all about it, right? Um, but actually, that's where your angel source is from. And so there's definitely a way of saying, how do we promote SEIS and EIS investing in females who are in large corporate roles where they have the funds potentially available to be able to become business angels so sorry i i, I jumped in there but i just think it's really important i don't know what and jane was in banking so you probably did jane but I, but i didn't i didn't actually so that shows my ignorance so yeah i wish i had known and exactly. there is a and whole... sorry go ahead ellie there's a whole piece of work that is happening behind the scenes and partly off the back of the investing woman code um, but there are communities in place like Inclusive Angels who are specifically set up to try to raise awareness so that females can get into the angel community and slightly break some of the stigma, I guess, involved. We've all probably experienced having worked in corporate, uh, most of us, that feeling of being one of the only females in the room. And actually, that's probably some of the prevention of why people don't go into those communities. And um, you made a point as well about women um, or people investing in people that remind them of themselves. Um, so just like on that a little bit, you know, women, sometimes we hold ourselves to account to very strong values and belief systems. Not saying that men don't, but, you know, it, women, it's, it's very kind of at the forefront. Um, and Claudia, um, you work for B Corp Certified Business. Um, your own business has got a real ethical stance to it as well. Um, so I just wondered, like, do you believe that kind of women have kind of more purposefully led businesses and how can having some of these visions incorporated into their businesses kind of press forward for the future? Yeah, so um, it's actually just really interesting hearing Alison's stats just now, actually, because um, when uh, this was kind of floated with me, I, one of the things I thought about was that women, I think, are the driving force behind sustainability in business and have been quite ahead of time because we are the consumers of less sustainable goods. We are the fast fashions, we're the makeup, we're the female hygiene products, you know, all these things that are actually going back out to world. And we see more of a mass of what it is that we're consuming and using compared to men. 
Um, and off of the back of that, I actually think that women are like, right, we need a company that uses, you know, reusable tampon applicators. We, we need something with a sustainable makeup packaging and, and all of these things. And actually, that's amazing. And I, I think that women have actually been definitely that driving force behind sustainability in business. But I do think that men are now catching up and I'm starting to talk to men. And it's like when you have those conversations around their sustainable ideas, it comes in a, oh, we're a sustainable tech business. And that's really interesting. Um, so when Alison said that, I was like, okay, like we've got some stats to kind of actually, from, from my personal experience with, with speaking to many entrepreneurs, um, it, it, it's really interesting. Um, but the thing is, is that the thing that we do need to think about is that sustainability isn't just about, you know, your supply chains as, as females coming up. It's actually about your workforce. You know, there are many businesses who are like, oh, well, things are ethically made out in a, in a foreign country, but actually, you know, how do you treat your staff with, within the UK? How are you, you know, building those really strong I kind of guess sustainable and ethical to me go hand in hand with a business um and yeah how how you are running your business in and out and actually things like b corp you are looking at social and environmental responsibility across all the board that you're doing you actually lose points on your application for b corp if you don't have a supply chain so you can't actually get up into those higher rankings which is quite interesting I actually found that out yesterday um because i was at a sustainable marketing event <laughs> and uh, asked the question around supply chains and b corp um but yeah i definitely think that women definitely have those more sustainable ideas and are those those driving forces you did ask me something else but i've forgotten <laughs> what it was sorry yeah no just your just your experience in it i think you've answered it beautifully um claudia and i guess just again i mean very rapidly running out of time and i feel like we've got so much we could still discuss but really wanted to tap into your experiences as female entrepreneurs and where you get your source of networking support like where does it come from are there gaps are there more that we could be doing so um jane you know you've very recently set up business how are you finding things um i've been really lucky i mean i i think if you're brave enough to just go and uh, try and meet people and and reach out to people i've been amazed at how many um, you know, men and women have been willing to help me. So I think, you know, try to build some confidence and approach people. Don't be shy about it. I think women are so resourceful. We often think we have to do everything on our own. I don't, I don't, I, I'm one of those people who absolutely tries to do everything myself and then sometimes falls over as a result of it. So, you know, I, I think network is probably the biggest, biggest thing is try and build your network. And also is that patience thing about, you know, what um, Alison talked about, you know, how many rejections you get, you know, people don't reply back to you write to them again I don't you know I, I think I'm probably a real pain now because I just keep writing to people I haven't heard back from and until I get a response and eventually I get a response and then things happen so I think don't be worried if people don't reply immediately just just keep pushing um and and you know almost be the person that you uh, I don't really want to be that person who pushes but I've just had to become that because I'm like I, I just can't take no for an answer until I, if I get a no that'll be fine but not having an answer at all I just keep pushing that push is so important. I've got this analogy of my dogs that literally, they just keep pestering yeah. me to go out for a walk in the afternoon. And they are just, you know, they're just consistent and just always expect a yes. And yet we're so negative, aren't we? We kind of go, oh God, I've asked them once. Oh, what did I do? So that kind of self-criticism is really is really yeah, high as well. Pushing. Yeah, you, you will eventually get a response. And, and okay, maybe they'll think less of you. I don't think they do. I think people are just busy. And if, if you keep pushing, then it demonstrates your results. So. Yeah. And Alison, from your perspective, someone who's you've had your business a little bit longer, um, how has it evolved in terms of what what support you've needed as well? Yeah, I think this is really interesting. So and we went through a 225 percent growth from 2020 to 2021. We'll do 75 percent this year. Um, and without the support of people who had been on that journey, regardless of gender, we would have made a whole bunch of mistakes. Um, and so I think making sure that you're reaching out to people. When I first set up the business, I did 100 coffees in 100 days to kind of test the concept. And the first 10 people I knew, the other 90 I didn't. I just asked everybody who they thought I should be talking to in order to, to, to get the right advice. And I think the same applies at whatever stage in your journey. Now, I can't afford to do 100 coffees in 100 days now. Um, but actually, this the, the kind of reach out that says... I need help is the biggest thing. And actually, we're really good at doing it. You know, I, I remember sitting in, in a meeting with, with our tech team one day and saying, 
all of the words that you have just said are all English and as individual words, I understand them, but you've now put them all together in a sentence and I don't know what you're talking about. And actually being bold enough and brave enough to say that I think is a really good thing. Um, and, and I must also do, um, I want to say a plug, but that's the wrong thing. So Innovate UK are doing lots and lots in this space. I was lucky enough to win a Women in Innovation Award um, and grant from them in 2020, 2021. Um, if you've got a good business idea, it's absolutely worth pushing it through their programme and seeing what they say, as are, as are NatWest. You know, there are so many different um, companies and corporates who are really saying we want to make a difference now. The, the only thing that is stopping them giving you that support is you asking for it. And as Jane says, keep asking for it. And um, Claudia, maybe just from your perspective, I'm sure we've got lots of people listening who are either in their own business or thinking of setting up their own business. Um, what, what advice would you give? Like what experience have you had that you would give and pass on to others? Um, so my advice kind of actually um, combines both of those previous answers is that actually networking is the, the best thing. It doesn't just put yourself in a room with people. You don't know who you're ever going to meet. You don't know what resources you're going to come across when you put yourself in a room filled with a whole bunch of random people. You also catch on very quickly if particular networks are right for you and what you're trying to achieve as well. And there's no harm in going and spending like an evening or a lunchtime going and mingling with a couple of other people. You might even make a friend, <laughs> if nothing else. Um, and the other advice is, again, just ask for help. I think that's something that I definitely have lacked in. Um, but it's, def yeah, just ask people for advice and continue to do that throughout the years of your entrepreneurial journey. Don't kind of think, okay, well, I'm two years in now, three years in, I shouldn't like, you know, I should know what I'm doing because actually you, you'll always be learning things and you always need to continue to learn. And, you know, you'll start off doing everything yourself and I still do basically everything myself for my business. Um, but yeah, just keep, keep learning, use the resources, find the resources and you know, I say use people in, in the nicest way. <laughs> so. Absolutely, absolutely. And just a final point, um, as I mentioned right at the start, the female edge is about bringing entrepreneurs together. You know, this has been really lovely just to connect with other female entrepreneurs and business leaders on this. Um, the next female edge assembly is on Thursday, the 21st of July. It's at Cassia um, on Bath Riverside. We're um, really pleased to actually be hosting Ellie Rowley um, back with us for that event, which is going to go into a lot more details about the Rose Report. And um, we're also going to have a little wine tasting, um, which the wines are all from female-led winemakers. Um, so if you're interested in coming along, we'd absolutely love to see you there. If you're interested, feel free to link with me on LinkedIn or check out Female Edge on socials. And um, we look forward to seeing you there. I think there might be a few questions. So I'm going to just have a, have a little nod towards Greg to see if there's any questions for us as well. Well, uh, thank you. I mean, it, that's, uh, yeah, it was an extraordinary session. I think it's, uh, we're very proud to put this on, very pleased that uh, the female edge has come forward for this. It is quite clear that the whole ecosystem of entrepreneurialism is missing out on opportunity. And however those opportunities are unlocked, whether it's through uh, organizations such as the Female Edge, uh, uh, activities such as this, which one hopes will give inspiration. And certainly when we come on to in a moment, uh, the, the talk from Georgia Stewart of Chumelo, um, it's quite clear that there are some incredible role models and some great stories out there which we've heard today. But I actually wanted to, um, and I apologize in advance, this is a, a discordant note I want to strike. Uh, and it's, it's less uh, my own personal perspective, but this is something which um, I'm sure that you are uh, reasonably familiar with. What do you say to those people, and there are actually some women as well as men, who believe it's actually not, or rather much less about gender, it's much more about quality of thinking and personal drive and confidence. That women wouldn't, don't need what, and I'm sorry to say this, what some might see as some form of special treatment or extra help. Told you it was discordant after you've been, you've been, you know. So, yeah, <laughs> so I'm sure we're all chomping at the bit. Oh, Greg, please, how long have we do. got? <laughs> please, it's a prompt. It's a prompt. Um, Alison, I see you're keen to answer this one. Go for it. Yeah, well, like, I just think, Greg, this comes down to the stats I gave earlier about the sorts of businesses that women are running, right? Uh, yeah, and, and the comments that come back. We, we cannot expect to be funded through the same routes 
as software businesses if we are running a health and fitness business because they won't scale and 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 this is businesses you know vcs are there to make money right as as our angel investors so uh, that's my starting point is we cannot expect the same and but then my flip side to that is actually what you get i think in female entrepreneurs is a resilience and that that is not necessarily true and and i think there's a difference between resilience and bloody mindedness and I've met a lot of bloody-minded male entrepreneurs. I've met very few bloody-minded female entrepreneurs, forgive the language, but a lot of very resilient female entrepreneurs. And I think that noting the difference in sectors and then noting the difference in, in those characteristics is important. But there are lots of successful female women out there. We just don't shout about it. Well, we, we will be shouting about, so we, we I hope we have already today, but we will be shouting about uh, in the remainder of EntreConf and subsequently, of course, Again, as a, a, a around this area, I think I think Leanne, you mentioned in uh, in your, your previous uh, corporate life that you had experience of um, almost being uh, somehow separated out as a woman. In a, in a, and and just talk to us about that uh, as an executive, what that was like. Yeah, absolutely. So, like some of the other panelists, I've come from the corporate background, um, and I was presented with this opportunity to go on a, a women's leadership course, which at the time um, I didn't appreciate at all. I was actually really insulted that they would put me on a women's leadership course and not just a leadership course. Um, and I think the times are changing and I think I feel differently about it now um, because I can recognize that there are differences. Um, I think I was probably just quite stubborn um, at the time and actually the learnings kind of ring true. But it, it really goes back right down to how we're raised, the messages we're told as young children how we're educated, what's open to us in the education space as well, because there are differences between the genders um, and there's just, you know, there's gaps that need closing. And I've got, uh, you know, friends who are very, very passionate um, about getting more education into school age children, but it, it starts nursery age even, just how children even play and interact. Um, listened to an absolutely wonderful podcast the other day about differences in the playgrounds between boys and girls and the different spaces they utilize and what they do within them. So it, it goes right down to the fundamental basics um, and it's just one step at a time. So I think that there's a lot to be done. We're still learning, but I'm really proud to live in a time where we are open to opportunities and where women are seen as um, valuable business leaders as much as, as men are. So that's something that we can't really take for granted because there's still many countries where that's not the case. But you are right there in that it is bridging the gap. We're not at the same starting point. And I think that goes back to the question that you originally asked there, Greg, is we have to make it a level playing field. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are specific women in business programs or um, different levels of support that you can access. But actually, why are we not just ring fencing things? So, um, for example, NatWest Accelerator is the application window is just opened. 50% of the intake that we get in is dedicated to be female entrepreneurs. Likewise, we've got a billion pounds of funding ring fenced to entrepreneurs that are female. So there is change that we can make and it's not necessarily having specific programs in place, but just an awareness that it needs to be diverse. Yeah, I'd also just very quickly like to add on to that. I found it really interesting. I'm sure most of you are aware of the Theranos scandal that happened and how lots of investors were screwed out of millions and billions of dollars. Um, it was really interesting watching all of these documentaries on it and seeing at the end that actually a lot of male investors now have scrutinized female entrepreneurs you know and, and that's not a retail business that's actually like could have been a world-changing thing had it actually been you know a legitimate business and you know i think it's extremely unfair to penalize female entrepreneurs based off of one female entrepreneur who's kind of done a disservice for us when there are a lot of men out there with hugely unethical terrible businesses that do not actually compute at all with what it is that they're saying to investors that they're going to get out of it um, so, you know, I definitely think there's some inherently built sexism within that and, you know, using one female as like the, the pillar as to why you won't invest into female technologies and things like that. So, yeah, bridging the gap would be to be a bit more open minded, um, you know, based on the fact that if an individual hasn't ruined uh, your investment <laughs> portfolio, that you should actually, you know, give them a shot. 
really, and even just an awareness of the language that you're using in terms of being a VC or being a funder, there are notable differences that you won't realise, but there's unconscious bias, there's stereotypes that go into the questions that you're asking. And so my call out to everyone on this is just to think about it. Take a step back and reflect. Take a step, take a step back and reflect. And, I, and I'm sorry to do that, that male thing of interrupting and, and speaking over, which is uh, uh, egregious, but we are out of time. Um, I would like to d just observe this, that of course, uh, you, you've absolutely quite rightly talked about uh, some of the complexities, societal, societal, attitudinal, baked in, ingrained, multiple different areas. Um, but I, I think what's come through, one of the elements that's come through today and more broadly in the entrepreneurial space is that there, change is happening. Change is not happening at an appropriate speed or a fair speed in a fair way, but change is happening. Uh, and we're, we're, you know, we are delighted to play our, our part in the broader e e ecological um, the ecosphere of entrepreneurs with uh, EntreConf today and with this session uh, uh, sponsored by the Female Edge. To you each, uh, to Leanne, uh, to Ellie, to Claudia, Alison and Jane, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and please do check their contact details on the site and on our social feeds. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.